Good morning, church family. Welcome to another online Living Hope edition. Hope that you guys are having a great summer. Uh, Fourth of July was last weekend, so I hope everybody managed to keep their fingers. I did. We had a great time, had some great camping. I'm hoping everybody's getting out there and enjoying this summertime. We still miss everybody. We miss being with you, and we miss having church. Obviously, I was a little excited about it last week when we uh, were able to get together on Wednesdays. But here we go again. We're starting another week. You never know what's going to happen. It's full of hope, full of excitement. And so we wish all the best to you and thank you for joining us once again online. Looking forward to seeing everybody once we get back together again.
the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Who could imagine? and 
So regardless of your circumstances, your conditions, or your location, or even your errors in life, he has a love for us that will never fizzle, a love for us that will never fail. Romans 8.38 states that no height or depth or any other created thing will have power to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. How many times in our lives has he made all things come together for our good? We have testimony after testimony of that happening. Psalms 30, verse 5 states, There may be pain in the night, but joy comes in the morning. I see the tone of this next song as giving thanks to our God for his never failing.
mercies for me every day Your love never fails You stay the same through the ages Your love never changes There may be pain in the night But joy comes in the church family do you like food i don't know about you guys but me i'm a huge fan i love food what can i what, what can i say the one thing i like more than food is fast food and there's this distinct difference food is good but fast food is legendary so today i'm gonna be taking you on a journey where i rank fast food restaurants now i want to make it very clear that everything i say here is indisputed fact this is the truth <laughs> arby's i don't know if i've ever been to an arby's i think i ordered like a meat there it was pretty good i'm gonna put it in b you know b it's pretty average <laughs> what can i say burger king they make good good burgers but they're not the best so i'm gonna put it in uh in an a tier but it's not that s tier that we're talking about little caesar's pizza it's pizza so you know i would say that it's on the lower end of good pizza so uh 
Yeah, B tier. All right, fellas, now we got Taco Bell. Legendary restaurant. Good food, good prices. Fantastic stuff. I walk in there and I'm like, I want three tacos, and they give me three tacos. Not just well made. Uh, their heart and souls poured into making it, but for a low, low price. And so, that is an easy... I'm gonna put it in A tier. What can I say? Good stuff. All right, Chipotle. It was a pretty good restaurant, but like everyone was like, bro, they got Chipotle. Oh my gosh, look, look, Chipotle. Chipotle. You know, solid stuff. Just doesn't reach that that legendary tier. Those A and S's, the ones where you just can't stop thinking about it day and night. All right, fellas, Domino's Pizza. I think they had like a funny ad. I can't remember. So I'm just gonna I'm gonna put it in B tier. Dairy Queen. Now this is an S tier. Let me just show this to you. All right. <laughs> Five Guys Burgers. Now, I like Five Guys Burgers, but if they had six guys, okay, that's not fun. Yeah, I've never tried it, so I'll brought to you. Jack in the Box. My friend told me, hey, we're going to Jack in the Box today. I was like, okay, never really been there. Um, and I think that was one of the only times I've been there, but it was a, it was a pretty decent memory, and I, and I got to share it with one of my close friends. So, you know, uh, for that reason alone, uh, I'm putting it uh, in low A tier. I don't remember too much about it. I think I tried Dr. Pepper for the first time in there. Uh, the drink of intellectuals for my connoisseurs out there. KFC S tier. When I was a kid, and they had this burger called the New Orleans Burger, and that thing was just a masterclass in its own. If you serve that to Gordon Ramsay, even he would fall victim to its savory, sweet taste. It was just so, so good. They don't serve it here, but like when I was a kid, it was just, it was. And then the chicken nuggets. Oh my goodness. I remember every time I go to KFC, just chicken nuggets, chicken nuggets, chicken nuggets. And they always, always did me well. Fantastic stuff. Love KFC. McDonald's. I love McDonald's. I, I love it to death. There's something about how they prepare the meat that just makes it no other homemade grill. Other restaurants have not matched the level that McDonald's has set for them, all right? McDonald's is in a league of its own. Fantastic stuff. Love McDonald's. And now Panda Express. My expectations are low for Chinese restaurants in America. So at the end of the day, I think it belongs in C tier. I think that that is the most fair, most reasonable uh, area I can give it. All right, fellas, now we got Papa John's. Easy S tier. Easy S tier. The thing about uh, Papa John is that my friend was like, you have not lived until you've gone to Papa John's pizza. And I took his word for it. You know what? I, I was like, all right. I'll go to Papa John's and and let me tell you don't take it from his words but take it from mine you have not lived until you've gone to Papa John's pizza absolutely legendary great pizza great cr I love the crust then Papa John's comes in waltzing in with their their 189 IQ starts their mind has expanded like it was just it was incredible they walk in and we're like bro this bread is good but what if we added a dip a dip bro ascended it's just what can i say it's just too good and they, they dip that in oh my gosh it's so good it's so good and then then the pizza i think it's like the pizza is a tier better than any other pizza restaurant then they put in the sauce kicks them up to s tier flawless stuff pizza hut i'd say it's better than most pizza restaurants not at the the legendary the absolute ascended tier of papa john's but it's up there it's up there it's solid it's subway now I want to put Subway in a low tier because everyone, everyone like is like you gotta eat Subway. It's healthy, and uh, you know if I'm going to a fast food restaurant, you, can, you already know I'm not there to eat healthy. But I have two reasons why I don't want to put it in a low tier. Number one, you literally make the sandwich, so you're you're saying your own taste is bad. And number two, my best friend uh, works at a Subway. I think I'll put Subway over here in A tier. It's better than Jack in the Box. I th I'd say um, I have good taste. Wendy's. I'm gonna say it, boys. I'm not a huge fan of Wendy's. It's solid. It's solid. It's, it's better than Jack in the Box. It's right up there in A tier. So don't, don't kill me. But for some reason, there are people out there. You say, you know, Wendy's. It's it's just it's a nine out of ten. And then they just get. It's a 10 out of 10. It's a 10 out of 10. Funny tweets don't make the food taste better, ladies and gentlemen. That's the lesson we learned today. Still A tier. Great food. I know I said 9 out of 10. 8 out of 10 at best. Um, Good stuff. Good stuff. And fellas, that's the end of the tier list. I hope I hope these facts lined up with yours. Because if you don't, you need to go to a doctor and get it checked out. But other than that, that's all from me, fellas. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for joining me. I'll see you next time, fellas. Peace out. <laughs> I'm an innovator.
Good morning, Living Hope Church family. This is Paul V coming to you this week. Pastor Jeremy is on vacation, so I'm filling in for him. And I want to talk about Jesus and the storm from Mark chapter 4, verses 35 through 41. Kind of a a little bit of a different passage than we've been studying Daniel, and that's been great. I've loved it. And this is going to dovetail with that, but from the New Testament. Before we get started, let's pray. Father, I thank you for a chance to speak, and I pray for an anointing of the Spirit. For all of us, God, we need to be hearing, we need your Spirit to be speaking, we need to uh, have everything cleared out of our mind that uh, shouldn't be there, and we want our heart to be attentive to you. We want our heart to be yearning for the right things, and we want to... We want you to minister to our hearts in a deep way. So I pray as this message goes out, God, that you will do your good work and that you'll show me how to speak. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So the topic today is going to be fear. We're not supposed to have fear as Christians, are we? But so many times we do. So I want to talk about fear. As Christians, we're called to be light in this dark and fearful world. We're living in a time of tremendous uncertainty. People are overwhelmed by fear. They're, people are, some people are paralyzed. Some people just don't know what to do. People are living in desperation sometimes. And uh, this is a really, really uncertain time, unlike any other time that I've lived through. So we're really called to be light. But uh, I, I struggle with fear. It's been a struggle for, for years for me. And by no means am I uh, someone who feels like I'm, oh, you know, I'm a, I'm a person who's victorious over fear. But I want to talk about this passage. I want to dig into it because I think there's some really hopeful things as we look at this passage. And I want to talk about them. Because maybe you, like me, struggle with fear. Uh, I used to tell myself, you know, most of the things I fear won't come true. And for many years, that was pretty much the case. But in the last five years, a lot of things that I feared would happen have happened. And I've not been able to avoid them. I've not been able to tell myself this won't happen because it did happen or it is happening. And so I've been struggling with fear and I want to talk about it. You know, fear is powerful. It can make it impossible for you to get the deep, refreshing rest you need. It can paralyze us. So we don't do something that we know we need to do right now. I mean, for about uh, five or six months, I've known I need to see the dentist. You know, there's just been an issue with one of my teeth and I've had some soreness there and you know, I think I, I need to make that appointment and I put it off and I put it off and I put it off. Finally, I did see the dentist. It required some, some major work, but it wasn't as horrible as I thought. So praise God for that. But fear is powerful and fear can manipulate us. It can control what we will do and what we won't do. And even when we try to not let us control us, fear can still make our life miserable because it can be exhausting just to keep on having to face fear. Does fear ever win the victory in your life? For me, it has many times. Now, you know, as Christians, we're not supposed to have the same kind of fears as the world does, but sometimes it seems being a Christian (laughs) gives us more reason to fear. I mean, that's my fleshly mind thinking there, but I mean, Jesus says to Christians, you will be hated by all nations for my namesake. And Jesus also said, if people persecuted me, they will persecute you as well. So as we are called to be light and as we want to live as light, uh, things can actually be hard for us in ways that it's not hard for unbelievers. The Bible says all who seek to live a godly life will be persecuted. So life is sometimes complicated, more complicated as a Christian. I hate dealing with my fears, but I often feel powerless to to stop feeling afraid. 
The Bible actually says in Romans 8, verse 15, that there is something called a spirit of slavery that leads us into fear. A spirit of slavery. Do you want to be a slave to fear? I know I don't want to be a slave to fear. But how can I defeat fear? How can I be light in this time of fear? When I feel powerless as I battle my own fears. So let's take a close look at Mark chapter 4, verses 35 through 41. Familiar passage, but so good, so much to see in this passage. Let me read it. As evening came, Jesus said to his disciples, Let's cross to the other side of the lake. So they took Jesus in the boat and started out, leaving the crowds behind, although other boats followed. But soon a fierce storm came up. High waves were breaking into the boat, and it began to fill with water. Jesus was sleeping at the back of the boat with his head on a cushion. The disciples woke him up, shouting, Teacher, don't you care that we're going to drown? When Jesus woke up, he rebuked the wind and said to the waves, Silence, be still. Suddenly the wind stopped and there was a great calm. Then he asked them, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? The disciples were absolutely terrified. Who is this man? They asked each other. Even the wind and the waves obey him. I was reading from the New Living Translation. In this passage, there are two key snapshots of Jesus that we really need to think deeply about. Uh, the first one, which is often the main focus as people look at this passage, and certainly it is really important, is in verse 39, where Jesus wakes up, he rebukes the wind and says to the wave, silence, be still, and nature obeys Jesus. The wind stops, and there's a great calm on the Sea of Galilee. But there is another very interesting moment in this episode in the life of Jesus, and it's found in verse 38, where it tells us Jesus was sleeping at the back of the boat with his head on a cushion as this storm rages around him. I love artwork, and one of the paintings of this story focuses on this moment when Jesus is sleeping and the disciples are coming to wake him up. Oftentimes we see the picture of Jesus standing, maybe at the bow of the boat with his arms wide open, and he's saying, silence, be still. And a lot of artists have captured that moment. But Jules Joseph Menier is capturing this moment of Jesus still asleep on the boat. And so I want to ask, I want to get us to think about this question. Why does Jesus go to sleep on the boat? Is that, is this, what's the importance of that? And it really does change the story and how we read the story. Imagine that Jesus doesn't fall asleep and the storm comes and he just rebukes the wind of the waves. That'd be a great story showing his power. But before that, he is asleep. And so I want to ask too, is Jesus trying to teach us something? Is Jesus speaking by sleeping? One thing that is very clear is this. Jesus is not a slave to fear. Fear has no power over him. And Jesus wants us to know that we can have the freedom he has, the freedom from fear. So let's dive into the passage now as we look at everything we want to notice, how Everything is getting set up for Jesus to speak to us while sleeping. First, the scripture tells us that it is Jesus who leads his disciples into this storm. It is his idea to cross the Sea of Galilee on this day. So the disciples are facing the storm because they are doing exactly what Jesus told them to do. You sometimes hear, well, if you're a Christian, life gets easy. If you're a Christian, uh, you know, God is going to, you know, do all these things 
for you. But actually, there's also a truth that Jesus will lead us into storms and we will face storms because we're doing the right thing. Sometimes we're facing, we're doing exactly what Jesus has told us to do. And that often happens. And so as we read this episode, uh, the disciples and Jesus are in the boat and they're crossing the sea and suddenly the wind kicks up. And just like that, they find themselves in the middle of a bad storm. We don't know how bad it was that day, but I did some research and found out in 1992, there was a storm on the Sea of Galilee that produced waves 10 feet high. That's, that's pretty dangerous for a boat this size. So this is a, a tremendous storm and it terrifies the disciples. And in the back of the boat, on a cushion, Jesus is fast asleep. And one of the things that I, I guess, came to appreciate more this time as I was reading this passage is that the disciples are, get really, really upset about Jesus being asleep. They say, hey, this isn't right. Jesus is completely at peace during this terrible storm, and he shouldn't be at peace. So the disciples feel this great need to, to try to bring Jesus out of his peace. He's way too peaceful. The storm is way too terrifying. He can't be that peaceful right now. And so they go and they wake him up and they say, Master, don't you care that we are about to die? So Jesus gets up and he does something that absolutely shocks the disciples. They have no expectation that Jesus is going to do this. He rebukes the storm. He commands the storm to cease and the wind and the waves obey him and the storm stops. The story could end there. We'd have a great moment of just this miraculous power from Jesus. But Jesus isn't finished yet. After rebuking the storm, he has something to say to his own disciples. Let's look at that. That's found in verse 40. So there's a great calm now on the sea. Then Jesus asked them, why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? So now that the storm is all over, are the disciples out of danger? No, they're not. They are not free from fear. And Jesus is really concerned more concerned about the fear that they have than he was about the wind and the waves. And, okay, there I am, in the same boat, shall we say, as the disciples, struggling with fear. And I need to listen to Jesus. And I need to ponder him. I need to look at him. And I want to ask this question, do we know the peace that Jesus had? Or are we still slaves of fear? Do we need the storm to go away first before we can find peace? Because that's not the peace of Jesus. Jesus did not need the storm to go away, to have peace. I don't even think he needed to know he had authority over the storm. He did have authority, but his peace didn't come from his authority over the storm. His peace is coming from somewhere else. Do we know the peace that he had? What would it take for you and me to experience the same peace that Jesus had? Because I believe Jesus is offering this to us. Jesus said to his disciples, my peace I give you. That's a gift. And I also want to take a closer look now at the words that Jesus speaks to his disciples after the storm is all over. These words are intended to sink down deep. So let's look. And um, again, we're looking at verse 40. The storm is over now, but Jesus speaks to the disciples 
And I want you to notice that Jesus wants his disciples now to face two questions. The first question that he asks them is, uh, actually, I need to say this. (laughs) We often misread these questions as statements. So Jesus says, first question, why are you afraid? Or why are you so fearful? And we often hear that and say, well, what Jesus is saying is there is no reason for you to be fearful. It is foolish for you to be fearful. We read the the question and we make it into a statement. But Jesus doesn't make a statement. He asks them a question. He asks them a question, why are you afraid? And I want to deal with that question. I actually have come to to think about this. Is there any benefit to actually taking time to explore that question seriously? Why do we get afraid? We can say, I shouldn't have reason. I have no reason to be afraid. You know, after everything's all over, after things better, we can say, I don't really have a reason to be afraid. That was dumb to be afraid. But the fact is, I was afraid. My heart thinks there is a very good reason for me to be afraid. I need to understand, my heart thinks there is a reason for me to be afraid. And should I, shouldn't I try to understand how my heart has ended up in fear. How did that happen? I think there's benefit in really dealing seriously with this question, not brushing it off, not saying, you know, it's stupid for me to be afraid, but why? How is this happening? What's going on in my heart that makes me end up in fear? And the fact is, we're in fear because of some kind of deception. And our deceptions we can never, ever see because our deceptions make so much sense to us. So we need to ask God, you know, Lord, search my heart. So here's a prayer we can pray. Lord, search my heart. I cannot know my own heart. I can't understand my heart without your help. Show me what I fear, show me why I'm afraid. Ask that question of God, have a notebook and see how he answers. I think we should be praying with a notebook. That's a, another issue with me. So, um, And then Jesus also asks another question and he says, do you still have no faith? Now, why does Jesus want us to face that question? He asks the disciples, And I think he's asking us the same question. Why don't you have more faith? What's blocking, what's hindering your faith? Again, why is Jesus asking this question? And we have, we read this and we think, well, you know, is it because Jesus wants me to feel stupid? Uh, No, but um, does he, does he, is Jesus's intent to make us try harder to have faith? What is the point of Jesus? Well, maybe it's this. I don't know. Maybe Jesus wants us to see this. Each unhealthy fear we have can be traced to some specific kind of unbelief we have in our heart. There's a reason we're afraid. We have unbelief. And You know, we often, you know, we love to have God just kind of snap his fingers and fix us. But God doesn't often work that way. In fact, he rarely works that way. There's a lot of stuff we need to face. What's my fear and what's the unbelief behind it? Why do I have that kind of unbelief? Because there are many kinds of unbelief. Here are some different kinds of unbelief we can have. Number one, we can say, God doesn't notice me. God doesn't see me. God isn't always 
available. I'm on my own. And we think we're on our own. Life can be a very fearful place. We can also think God won't defend me. God, I, I need to stick up for myself because God won't defend me. Is that a lie that you might believe? We might think God is harsh. God is cold. God is distant. There's all kinds of beliefs we have. And Satan wants us to agree with these lies. He wants to get us to agree that this is true about God. What kinds of unbelief do you have? And if we sat down and we made a list, what's our unbelief? What would that list look like? So now, okay, so we face this fact. We have unbelief. Um, Can we just decide by trying really, really hard next time that we can move ourselves out of unbelief and into belief? Can we try really hard to do this? Um, no way. We cannot save ourselves from our unbelief. So the disciples, Jesus is pointing out, you've got an unbelief problem. That's where your fear is coming from. Eventually, they're going to understand, yes, they ha- we have this unbelief problem, and there's nothing that we can do to solve this problem on our own. Jesus alone must bring us into his peace. You know, one of the things, too, that we see is that the unbelief of the disciples causes them to completely misunderstand this message. Jesus is sleeping. And they completely misunderstand what that is about. They think he's sleeping. What do they think he's sleeping for? They think he's sleeping either because he is unaware of the storm or maybe because he doesn't care about them. They wake him up and they say, Master, don't you care that we are about to die? Don't you care that we're about to drown? Were they, were they doubting his care for them? As I've been thinking, and I've been you know, spending time with this passage, and I just, I've been looking at it, pondering it. I want God to show me and I, uh, what's going on. I want God to deliver me from my fear. And as I've been thinking about the rest of Jesus here, the rest that he has, I had this thought that Jesus is resting in the presence of of his father. I think there's a a rest that's more than a rest. I think he's he's completely at peace. He is he f- senses the presence of his father. And I think maybe Jesus is soaking in the love of his father here. He's soaking in his father's love. He heard his father before Jesus did a single thing, before he did ministry, before he went to the cross, the father said on his baptism, you are my son whom I love. In you I am well pleased. Jesus didn't need to do the ministry first to get his father's love. In fact, Jesus said, you loved me before the foundation of the world. That's in John chapter 17. Jesus could rest and know that he was loved by his father. Do we know how to rest in the presence of the father? Do we know how to soak in the love of God the Father? That's Jesus. You know, they're trying to pull, the disciples are trying to pull Jesus out of his peace. And Jesus wants to bring them into it. 
how I need Jesus to take me by the hand and lead me and show me how to enter in to this kind of rest. And I think yeah, this is where uh, I want to go with this message. Well, the disciples were fearful here. Did the disciples ever change? Well, we go through the gospel. They're fearful. There's another episode of a storm. Jesus is walking on the water, and they're fearful then. And then when Jesus is arrested, they scatter. When Jesus on trial, Peter's too afraid to stand up for him. I mean, on and on the fear goes. But they did change. In the book of Acts, Jesus promises that he will give them the Holy Spirit. And the disciples were transformed only when they were filled by the Holy Spirit. And I just picked out a few passages here. Acts 4.31, the apostles are threatened and they come together to pray about the threats they're facing. And they pray for boldness. And the scripture says in Max 4.31, And when they had prayed, the place where they had gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. With boldness here. Acts 11.24, speaking about Barnabas, says that Barnabas was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith. The disciples, you know, where is your faith, Jesus says to them. Barnabas was full of the Holy Spirit and with faith. I want to be filled with faith. I need to be filled with the Spirit of God to have faith. In Acts 12, Peter, who was terrified on the boat, in Acts 12, now Peter is in prison. James the son of Zebedee, James the apostle, has been executed by Herod. Peter is now next to be tossed out and killed. And he's in prison waiting for the next day when he will be taken to the people and they will demand his execution. And it says that Peter was sleeping between two guards. He was sleeping and the storm was raging around him. Isn't that the peace you want? It's the peace I want. So, we need to be a, it's a slide I threw together, just start jotting down some thoughts. I want my spirit to be attentive to the Holy Spirit. I want to be expectant. You know, I'm still struggling with fear, but I want to live in expectancy that I'm going to be filled in a new way by the Holy Spirit. I want to be longing for that. You know, some people pray, you know, we pray a little bit for the Holy Spirit. Pray. I want to have a longing to be filled, and not just me, but our church, our valley, the world. A longing. I want to have a longing for the filling of the Holy Spirit, and I want the Lord to show me what I need to see. There's something about him that I'm not believing, that I'm not seeing, and I need God to show it to me. So I'm going to end with an activity here, and uh, this is what I'm, I want to, want to put before you as a prayer exercise. And this is, um, maybe you could begin it in your homes today. Uh, I'm actually thinking maybe, you know, it's going to, so something for a week or a couple weeks or a month or I don't know, but uh, here's some things to think about i a lot of times people don't know okay we know that we need to come to god we know that god is the secret but how do we come to god in faith how do we pray to him so i want to give you some prayer suggestions here's three of ways we can pray as we seek to be delivered from fear i want us to pray and ask god just this kind of prayer show me god show me why i'm fearful what lies am I believing? What am I struggling to believe about you? And then pray that prayer and give God time to answer. Have a notebook. Be ready to write down what God shows you. Also, ask Jesus this. 
This is a Jesus, I need you. Please fill me with your spirit. I welcome your spirit to bring faith and hope into my heart. And, and again, that's a prayer that needs to be a longing. It's not a prayer we should pray just once. It's a prayer that needs to become a true longing that God, Jesus, will fill us with the Spirit. We need the Spirit from Jesus. We need the Spirit from God. And then as you pray, say to God, and this is, a, this is something I, I try to practice Please guide my heart into your love and peace. Please guide my heart. And then allow God several minutes to guide your thoughts. Just give God permission. Give the Spirit permission. You may to guide your thoughts. Don't try to talk a lot. Just try to be in a posture of listening and saying, God, show me. Uh, you may find that listening to a favorite worship song can help you. I wouldn't do it for the whole time because I think it's good to have some time of just real silence. But to get into that, that spirit of worship and to be in communion with Jesus and in communion with, with the Father, we want to be uh, in a worshipful space and we need to be quiet too. And so also be quiet, be still, and invite and allow the Spirit of God to guide your heart and be seeing, is God giving you any images? Maybe those images are God's Spirit speaking to you about something. Maybe God's going to bring a verse to mind. Maybe God's going to say a word to you, remind you of a message you've heard, remind you of a time someone encouraged you, remind you of some important word that he's given you in the past or maybe he's going to give you a new word and invite god to speak let me just close in prayer father thank you for this moment to pray to look to you god we need you we need you to show us we need you to guide us why are we afraid what's hindering our faith God, we won't know unless you show us. God, we invite you to fill us, God. We want not just to, to pray. We want to have a longing for your spirit. When, oh God, when will you pour out your spirit? God, we don't want a little bit of your spirit. Only we want the fullness of your spirit. We want the fullness of faith and hope to be brought into our heart. Guide our hearts. Shepherd our hearts. Put our hearts in that place where we can soak in your love. Put our hearts in a place where we're able to hear. And I pray that as my brothers and sisters spend time this week praying, God, show them new things about your glory. Show them new ways of praying, new ways of connecting, new ways of listening new ways of soaking you in and being revived and renewed in the inner being in our soul. Thank you, God, for this time. Bless your word. Do more than we ask or imagine, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.